Hey, welcome to another Flare Court Media Whatever Wednesday. Today I want to talk about something that you've probably heard a lot about, but aren't quite sure what it is, and that's 5G. Now, 5G just simply means it's the fifth gen of cellular network. Uh, 1G being analog, that's the big saved by the bell speakerphone or whatever. 2G was where they switched to digital and started allowing text messages and internet to go through. And the very first iPhone was a 2G iPhone. And then 3G is what really allowed people to kind of come into the whole mobile world. That's where a lot of people got into it was with 3G. And that gave you better internet, you got to send bigger pictures, etc. And then 4G or LTE is where basically mobile network is as the internet. Like there's no distinguishing idea between cell phone internet and at home internet. It's all the same from the user's per perception. So 5G is the next iteration. Now there's more to it than just speed, <laughs> as the thumbnail told you. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of new technology that goes into it to help improve different things. Now I'm standing here because right behind me, there's a tower right in the middle, a light pole. And that light pole is covered in antennas. And that is a Verizon 5G ultra wideband antenna tower. And so if I come here with a 5G phone, give it a second for it to recognize that I'm near a 5G signal. Of course, it's not working. Dude, it's right there. This is the problem with ultra wideband. Like it's literally right there and I'm getting, you know, 4G speeds. So we're gonna talk about that as well as the ver varieties of 5G. <laughs> All right, I don't know where it's coming from, but somewhere right around here, hopefully it'll pop back into 5G. I was just getting it. There it is, okay, 5G. I don't know where the tower is coming from. I think the one I was showing you must be off because I was getting nothing, but down the street, I was getting something. I have stood directly below one and gotten it. And so I understand what it's supposed to look like. So that's why I think the one that I just showed you was not working. But you see, I just lost it again. That's the problem with this super fast 5G, the ultra wideband. It, because it's ultra wideband, that means it's millimeter wave is what they call it. And that means it does not travel very far. Things like trees and corners completely get rid of it. You could lose it, you know, putting it behind your body. Now I was under a good tower able to walk about two blocks away, including putting it in front of my body or going behind the glass of my car window. Right now I can't find where this thing is coming from. It keeps popping in and out. So I thought I could sit here and do a speed test, but I need to go find a different location. Okay, <laughs> I finally got a strong signal. But watch, when I move around this way, oh, see, I just lost it. <laughs> come back, come back, come back. There it is, okay. Let's do a quick speed test before it goes away. Go. Okay, so we're above one gigabit per second, which my home internet, fiber internet, the fastest I can possibly get to my home is one gigabit. And here we are at 1.4 gigabits, so almost 50% more, if math is right. I have been able to get up to 1.7 gigabits per second at a better location. So that's insane download speeds. And, but you notice my upload speed is only 45. That's because these do not have the power to beam back that strength of signal. So it's just sending it basically at a 4G speed for my upload, so it's the download that has all the power. But now watch them when I move here and put it in front of my body and odds are the 5G is gonna go away. There it went away. <laughs> so you see it's really fickle. So this tower is currently not turned on but it should be coming soon according to their map. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of technology that goes onto these towers for this ultra wideband. And they have to put one of these up every 300 meters or so that they want coverage. You can think of it kind of like a Wi-Fi router. You know, you need one in each building or every couple floors or something like that. But that's just one little device, whereas this, 
sure you're supporting a lot more devices like this could handle a lot of cell phones but that's a lot of <laughs> technology just to you know serve a 300 meter line of sight range of internet so running a speed test is all well and good but we're talking directly from verizon's network to verizon's towers sure i'm getting 1.7 gigabits but what does that equate to in real world so let's stop this speed test here and let's go try to download a large game so call of duty mobile that's uh, 1.47 gigabytes so let's click install and see how long that's going to take all right so here's the results of the download test of the call of duty mobile at 1.47 gigabytes uh, i tested it on wi-fi 5g and 4g and this is probably the most important thing you're going to see in this video with regards to expectations of 5G. So first I want to point out that this Wi-Fi is my home internet, that's gigabit fiber internet. And you can see that my download speed to my Galaxy Note 20 Ultra on my wireless AC router is 517 megabits per second on average. Now that's excellent because that's half of what plugging an Ethernet cable into a computer would get you. But if we compare that to 5G's reported speed, 1.7 gigabits per second, that's more than three times faster. And then if we come here and look at 4G, that's still excellent 4G speed. On my old phone, my Pixel 4 XL, I was getting, oh, you know, 60 or so. But the modem and antennas in this Galaxy Note 20 Ultra are much better, so I got 130 megabits per second. Okay, so... Now let's go ahead and look at the times though. We can more or less disregard this yellow because that is just the install time and that's 12 seconds and that's 12 seconds and that's 11 seconds. So it's the same all across the board. That's just how long it took my phone to process. But what's important here is despite the Wi-Fi being three times slower than the 5G, the time to download is significantly faster. So if you're kind of wondering what this time to until verification is, so when you're downloading a big app, it downloads to anywhere from 92% to 99%, and then it stops in terms of the progress bar moving forward, and it just, I assume it's verifying the data that's downloaded. So that's what the blue line is to wherever it stopped, 92%, and this was 99%, and this was 98%. And then the final 4%, or just before it started actually installing, so the download was done, that's the red. So that's really the most important number because that's when the install actually started after that. So like I said, Wi-Fi at three times less the speed is one minute and 41 seconds faster at downloading the 1.47 gigabytes than the 5G. And even the 5G compared to the 4G, I mean, really, the time isn't that much difference on the total time. Sure, the verification is faster, but that's only, you know, 18 seconds different in, in full time, despite being a much bigger difference between the speeds. And if you're wondering, no, it wasn't the ping time. The ping time on average was three milliseconds, and this was, I don't know, two milliseconds. I didn't record what the milliseconds were on this, but it was in the 50s. And the jitter was only five milliseconds. So it's not like this was having outrageous ping times. But remember, this was, the speed test was to uh, my provider, Allo, and this was to Verizon, and this was to Verizon. So I'm wondering, I really wish I had tested going to a different speed test provider because I'm wondering if they're cooking the books, making this number bigger by talking directly to Verizon. And then after you get to Verizon, then it slows way down. This is the only way I can figure that, or there's just so much overhead in a cellular connection, despite being way faster in raw data, the overhead of verification is just that much worse than a normal Wi-Fi and home internet. So anyway, don't let the numbers fool you in thinking that this is, you know, amazing, get rid of your home internet, because right now my home internet, despite being way slower, is kicking its butt in terms of actual useful speed. The ultra wideband is just one piece of the three piece puzzle. So we've got the ultra wideband, that's the high top speed, that's the one that's easiest to market, the one that gets people most excited about, but it's also the most finicky. 
Below that you have the medium band and the low band. Now Verizon and AT&T have put a lot of effort into the ultra wide band. In fact, that's pretty much all Verizon has at the moment. T-Mobile has put just a little bit in, a couple hot spots, but they've been focusing on the low band and medium band. So what's the difference? Well, the low band is what has allowed T-Mobile to unveil the nationwide 5G first, because I think in a way it almost uses the same infrastructure as LTE, I'm not quite sure, but basically they're using technologies to improve speeds by up to about 20%. Uh, using about the same frequency range as LTE. Then the medium band is, oh, was owned only by Sprint and that allows about six times the speed of LTE. Well, Sprint was just bought by, merged with T-Mobile, so now T-Mobile has low band and medium band and so now they're able to start working on the high band whereas Verizon, like I said, they worked on the high band and now they need to start building out their infrastructure on the lower band. So aside from just speed, there are more technologies coming to 5G and a lot of them are coming right from our Wi-Fi routers in our house. So one of them is MIMO, multi-in, multi-out antennas. And what that is, is, you know, back in the day when you only had like two or three things on your Wi-Fi network, a laptop, a phone, and maybe another laptop. Now we have 20, 30 devices. We have lights, we have refrigerators, we have TVs, we have all kinds of Wi-Fi signals in our house. So. The Wi-Fi group created something called MIMO to allow support for all these devices to get attention when they need it and get the, continue to get speed. Well, that's something they're bringing to 5G is they're bringing massive MIMO. And what that is is basically the ability to handle more devices on one node. Something else that they're bringing from Wi-Fi routers is beam forming. And basically it's Wi-Fi magic is the only way I can describe it. They take multiple antennas and triangulate where your device is. And then they use the power of reflective beams to focus the signal towards your device. So in the old days, it'd just be a circle. They just send it out in all directions unless it was specifically a directional antenna. And so that's a lot of extra you know, noise pollution um, radio wave noise pollution that would affect other things. Plus it's not putting all the power directly towards your device. So now using the band beam forming, they can signal in and bounce things off walls and stuff to get to your device better. So they're bringing that to 5G. The other thing that they're also bringing is closer compute units. So right now you talk to a cell phone tower, it has to go talk to its processing center, all that stuff. Well, they're bringing that processing center, that computing center closer to the actual tower, which is going to lower latency. Why do you care about lower latency when maybe all you care about is videos and you can just wait for it to buffer, buffer a couple more milliseconds? Well, lower latency, we're talking one millisecond to three milliseconds, that's close to fiber speeds in your home. That is going to be better for things like smart cars who need to talk and make split second decisions and they need that information quickly, you know, things are changing, I need, I need instructions that I can't process or I need more information about the context of the traffic or something like that. Having faster, shorter speeds between them and the server is going to improve the, their ability to function. But so what do these non-speed related technologies mean for the end user? Well, not a whole lot that's tangible other than the fact that you may see more consistent internet speeds. So right now on a good 4G E LTE connection, you may get you know, 60 megabits per second. But the moment you move into a congested area like a park or a stadium or downtown area, your speeds may tank down to like five megabits per second. And so in 5G with these new, the extra carrying capacity, you may only go down to 20 to 30 megabits per second. And that's going to allow you to stay on the cell phone network longer. So right now, if you go into a stadium, oftentimes you just have to fire up Wi-Fi and connect to their unsecured Wi-Fi network. And that unsecured means that it's not secured. Plus you're limited to whatever the speed that that Wi-Fi network is. But with the ability to remain on 5G inside of these congested areas, it's going to be more secure. Your phone is going to continue to talk directly to the tower. Odds are you're going to see more consistent speeds. Right now, I know there's someone in the comments saying, but Jason, I heard 5G is bad for your health. Let me stop you right there. No, it's not. The part of the electromagnetic spectrum that these 5G signals run in is lower than light. And what that means is 
it's non-ionizing electromagnetic radiation. Ionizing radiation is ultraviolet, which is just above visible light, ultraviolet and up. And that's the stuff that comes in and steals electrons from your atoms and destroys your DNA. And that's why we tell you to wear sunscreen because you're bombarded by that all the time. And this ultramagnetic band that we're using for 5G is way below that. And it does not cause any known cancerous or otherwise health results. Then I know there's some of you are going to say, but Jason, there is a governing body that has released a document that says there is a chance that 5G Wi-Fi could cause ill health effects and cancer. And that governing organization has to err on the side of caution. They will say anything could cause those if a significant study hasn't been done to prove otherwise. If there's even a tiny tangible amount of evidence that something could be bad for your health, they will mention it. It's kind of like when you use a device that says, the state of California says that there's something in here that could cause cancer, but you continue to use it anyway. That's because if we use things safely, it's not gonna be bad for our health. As well as the thing in there, sure, there may be an element that could cause cancer, but when put together in the whole unit itself, it hasn't, isn't going to cause cancer. But significant study hasn't been done to prove that that isn't bad for your health. And so what I'm saying is basically, we've been using these Wi-Fi frequencies for years. They're really close to our Wi-Fi routers. We've been using them for TVs. They're all lower than ionizing radiation. And so they're not bad for your health. And until a study is done to prove that they are bad for your health, there's no reason to be concerned. So as I was explaining this new technology, something should have been glaringly obvious. And that's the fact that there's not a whole lot of incentive for carriers to deploy 5G in rural parts of the United States. Sure, LTE turned on nationwide 5G, but they're still missing a lot of sections. And I don't expect them to necessarily try to reach those new sections anytime soon, just because there's not the need. In order to get the super high speeds, you need those ultra wideband towers that don't cover very far. And then the extra carrying capacity just isn't needed in less dense parts of the United States. So that's why you're going to continue to see 5G, the fast stuff, the stuff you actually are going to want to play with and care about, is going to continue to be in high, dense urban populations. And then the medium band is going to be covering you know, bigger cities. And that's why you're going to continue to see it go from large areas to smaller areas. And maybe eventually, like LTE, it'll cover most of the United States with the low band. So what that amounts to is basically, even in 2020, there's not a real good reason to buy a 5G phone specifically. Now, if the phone you want has 5G in it, great, you're future-proof. That's what I did with my Galaxy Note 20 Ultra. I wanted the phone, I'm good to go now. But if you're looking at two different phones, one of them has 5G and one of them doesn't, and the one that doesn't is less expensive, unless you're living in a stadium, living in a high congested non-stop area, and you already have 5G, there's really not a good reason to pay the extra money right now, because it's going to take a while for them to continue to roll out the network. And I said, you're not going to see those speeds, really, unless you're near one of the high speed centers. And unless you're dropping signal all the time due to congestion, you're not going to see benefit from the extra carrying capacity. But that's going to do it for this episode of Flare Court Media. If you appreciate the information, then please consider giving me a thumbs up down below. And then go ahead and share it out with your friends. So that way they can learn about this new technology that we're going to be living with for the next decade, probably. And then if you want to get notified whenever I release a new video, click the subscribe button down below and then right next to it's the bell. And that way you get notified the moment I release a new video on content creation or technology or whatever type videos. But until next time, I'm doing what I love. Keep doing what you love. Thanks for watching.